All right, so the main, main part of our uh, first video in this chapter centered around the idea that we have to treat light energy in some cases in order to understand its behavior as a particle. Um, one of the other things that was discovered around the first part of the 20th century was that things that we've always thought of as particles in order to explain their behavior will sometimes have to be treated as waves. Experiments continued to show around this time period that not only does light sometimes behave um, as though it was a particle, but particles have to be treated like waves. In 1924, Louis de Broglie proposed that a relationship that had been derived to relate momentum and wavelength of light could also be used for particles. So that we say wavelength of um, a particle, if we're going to treat it as a wave, would be Planck's constant over the momentum of that particle. For particles with a large mass, and by large I mean anywhere nearly large enough to see milligrams, um, this uh, uh, wavelength, even at a very small velocity, would be uh, a very, very, very small number. Um, but at um, for very, very small particles, the wavelength reaches a point, according to this equation, where the wavelength is on the order of the size of the particle. Experiments done by Davison and Germer in 1927 confirmed that electrons are diffracted if the diffraction experiments are conducted with diffraction grating on the order of the same size as the wavelength we would calculate for those electrons using de Broglie's equation. That usually comes out to be less than a nanometer, but again, that's roughly the size of the orbit of, uh, a, uh, of an electron. Um, so electron diffraction can be used experimentally to map out surfaces on crystals because electrons behave as waves, uh, or their behavior can be explained by treating them as waves under certain circumstances. So here's uh, another example problem. We won't work this one here in the video, uh, but we'll work this one in class uh, sometime in the next couple of class periods. Uh, go ahead and pause the uh, video now and, and write this problem down. Give it a shot on your own, and we'll work it out together uh, the next time that we meet. Let's take a closer look at electron diffraction. Um, if we consider an angle um, where we're talking about the angle between a, a particular slit and a minimum uh, in the pattern formed by electrons going through the slit, um, so we see electrons, uh, we see uh, evidence of electrons here. If we have a, a phosphorus film back here that lights up when it gets hit with charged particles, we see. Um, electrons hitting here, we see a large number hitting here, we see none hitting here or here. If we look at the sign of the angle between this slit and a minimum, um, we will see this relationship be, uh, um, obeyed, um, where A is the width of the slit, Lambda is the wavelength associated with the electrons based on their mass and velocity. N is some whole number, a quantum number we're going to start to call these whole numbers. Um, and like we said, uh, theta is that angle. Um, that angle, or that, uh, yeah, that angle will go to zero as um, A becomes large compared to the wavelength. Uh, now, if we do our diffraction experiment through a double slit at low intensities of electrons, we'll see what looks like a random pattern of them landing as they come through and hit the slit in the back. So at low intensities, it appears that the electrons, uh, in other words, less electrons per minute coming through the slits, it appears that the electrons are behaving like particles. But when we send them through very quickly, when we send a high intensity uh, group of electrons through. What we see is um, the exact pattern we would expect where we're sending light through very narrow slits. We see a diffraction pattern um, that uh, uh, mimics what we would have to, what we would see explaining electrons as waves. 
All right, so in addition to this evidence that was uh, put out in the 1920s, um, scientists in the early part of the 20th century were starting to look at the hydrogen spectrum. We mentioned this briefly in the first video. Uh, we have a gas tube filled with hydrogen. We force electri electricity through it. Light comes out. Same thing with neon and other gases. But with hydrogen in particular, we see something really neat. We shine that light through a prism, and we notice that there's four or five very narrow lines um, that are uh, visible to us. This one in particular would be invisible. Um, that are visible to us as part of that visible spectrum from the hydrogen gas. And so the question is, incandescent lights and some other molecules give fairly continuous looking spectrums. Why do only certain colors of light come out of hydrogen? And so from this idea started to stem in, uh, different ideas about the model of an atom. Um, combine these experiments with Rutherford's experiments that you learned about in general chemistry. And we see that the uh, energy emitted from the hydrogen atom is quantized uh, because of the behavior of the electrons as they orbit in some fashion the nucleus. Uh, experimentally, we get Rydberg's equation, um, which says that one over the wavelength of, and that's a you know a way of, of uh, uh, calculating frequency, be related to wave numbers. Uh, one over the wavelength of light is going to be Rydberg's constant times uh, one over n squared minus one over n squared, where the two n's are different integers, different quantum numbers. And so we call those ends now energy levels. Ryberg's constant experimentally comes out to this number, 109,677.581 reciprocal centimeters. So in this case, we're measuring wavelength in centimeters. And the assumption then that Niels Bohr came up with to explain this experimental observation is if we treat the electron as a wave that's orbiting a particular circumference, the circumference has to be some whole number of wavelengths in order to avoid having the electron's waves destructively interfere with themselves. Uh, in other words, if the um, orbit was as long as four and a half wavelengths, then on the second trip around, the new wave would be destructively interfering with the other one and the electron would cease to exist. Um, so each orbit has to be a whole number of waves or a whole number of 2 pi r. So we say that the wavelength has to be a whole number of 2 pi r's. And we substitute in de Broglie's idea for wavelength and we get this equation 2 pi r has to be equal to some whole number times Planck's constant over momentum, where momentum is the mass times the speed of the electron. Uh, we'll develop a new constant to kind of abbreviate things in this equation. H bar is just Planck's constant over 2 pi. And so now we get um, uh, momentum of the electron times the radius is equal to a whole number times H bar. Um, now, additionally, in order to avoid collapsing into the nucleus, the attraction force for the nucleus of the electron must be balanced by the centrifugal force of the orbit. Just like the Earth orbiting the Sun, the centrifugal force of the orbit has to balance out the gravitational attraction to the Sun. So instead of thinking of it in terms of gravity, we substitute in the terms that are necessary to explain electrostatic attraction, um, and then we can um, uh, combine this equation um, for the electrostatic um, and centrifugal force being equal with the equation we derived above and we get uh, and we can solve it for um, R uh, to get rid of the R term and uh, and this is what we have. I'm sorry, yeah, we'll solve it for R and this is what we have. These terms being related to electrostatics um, and these terms being related to what we just discussed. The total energy of the electron in a hydrogen atom, or total energy of anything, is going to be its kinetic energy plus its potential energy. 
So the total energy of that electron is going to be related to its speed and its mass uh, um, and its attraction to the nucleus, again the electrostatic terms. Um, so if we substitute um, in what we just calculate or what we just showed um, has to be the relationship between the velocity uh, and the radius of the orbit um, and the electrostatic terms we can uh, solve for the total energy of the electron and we have very similar terms here that we can combine and get this particular um, equation. Now on a previous slide we just solved for R so what we can do is substitute in what we uh, solved for R on that previous slide and uh, do some rearranging and we get the energy of an electron has to be negative uh, mass of the electron times uh, the uh, charge of an electron to the fourth power over 8 times the square root of permittivity of uh, free space times Planck's constant squared times n squared. And so if we look at the difference between one energy level and another, one n squared and another, we get this for an equation for a particular frequency of light. And if we put this into reciprocal centimeters for frequency, this converts exactly to Rydberg's constant. And so what Niels Bohr had done is derived from first principles Rydberg's experimentally determined constant. Um, and this equation gives perfect results for hydrogen experiments and terrible results for helium and any other atom or molecule larger than hydrogen, any system with two or more electrons. So we have, again, a new theory has to be better than the old theory in places where the old theory didn't work. And explaining hydrogen atom, the uh, old theory, classical mechanics, didn't work. Um, and the new theory works for that. So this is a better theory. It's not a great theory because it doesn't work for anything else. But we can take a look at the hydrogen um, atoms uh, spectrum and the uh, wavelengths of light that we see um, when we look at hydrogen and uh, at the hydrogen atom spectrum and account for them all based on Bohr's model and the difference between the radius associated with different energy levels n. And so we'll do some problems related to this as well in our uh, example problems that we do over the next day or two in class.